Thank you so much, everybody, um, for having me here. It has been um, a really great experience. I'm a midwife. I've been a midwife for a little less than six years. Um, and for most of that time, I've been um, sort of working in a pretty typical midwife capacity, attending births in a hospital, working for a private practice, um, which does happen to be, the at the moment, the only um, provider of obstetric services in our community other than home birth. Um, and increasingly in surrounding communities as well. There's sort of a crisis um, of access to prenatal care that is happening and building for everybody, um, and especially for people who have barriers to accessing care. Um, as of February, I um, sort of reduced my amount of time that I spend um, attending births and started working for Reach Medical, which is a harm reduction organization. Um, and what I do there is um, I'm a provider of um, buprenorphine, um, medically um, assisted treatment or medication for opiate use disorder, however you want to put it. Um, and I also do some primary care, um, pelvic sexual and reproductive health care there as well. And my hope and my goal and what we're working towards is trying to find a way to bring those two pieces together so that we can provide, you know, trauma-informed, um, harm reduction-oriented care to people who are um, pregnant or postpartum. So that's a goal that we're working towards. So briefly, I just wanted to um, take a couple, acknowledge a couple things here. Um, I think that throughout this day, um, we're talking a lot about language and how the language that we use um, can have an impact. Um, language isn't everything. You can use all the right language and still have a lot of harm behind, you know, your your speech. However, um, you know, using using language that is affirming of people's experiences and identities um, can make a difference too, um, and that can both harm and heal. So, um, most of the ways that I'm talking about language today have to do with um, stigma and reducing stigma. But I also just want to acknowledge. Um, that you know, not all people who are pregnant and give birth identify as women. So I'm trying to use um, you know gender inclusive language as much as possible. A work in progress as well, um, but just naming that. Um, I don't want to take too long on this, but I also just want to acknowledge that we all come to this work and this information um, with a whole lot. Like we bring a lot with us, and that is both our own lived experiences. Um, you know perhaps with substance use disorder, our own trauma history, our own experiences as providers of care. And then we also come into it with our own um, biases. And that's something that was being addressed at the lunch um, time as well. So um, I think it's worthwhile in our goal to be, um, to increase compassion and empathy in ourselves and in the, the ways that we interact with people to, um, try and acknowledge honestly the biases that we may have absorbed in our culture, or maybe like even through our lived experiences, right? And, you know, not necessarily to be like, oh, I shouldn't feel that way, but just to make space for that and acknowledge that, that's the first step towards moving beyond that. So um, one thing, you know, briefly, and is to just consider, you know, what comes to your mind when you think about someone who is um, pregnant and has an active use disorder, um, you know, what, assumptions might you make about um, what that person needs, what that person wants, um, what experiences may have led to that person's um, current, you know, place in life. And, you know, just it's worth all of us taking some time in ourselves and ongoing basis to kind of notice those things and, and try and release them, right? Because like, we don't know. Each, each individual experience that we have with another human is a brand new opportunity. And you know, we, don't, we don't know what that person is bringing to that moment. Um, so I'm not gonna belabor the statistics. Everybody in this room knows that we are experiencing an opioid crisis in this country, in this community, in this state. Um, this is just one little line among many, but this is, this is a graph of opioid deaths, opioid-related deaths in New York State. Um, and, you know, somebody said earlier, like, the way that we, that people can be reduced to statistics, and I think statistics are important for grounding us in, like, what is actually happening, but it also can be dehumanizing, right? So, like, every single dot on that graph is a human being whose life was lost, and that loss of life matters, and it was preventable, and it impacts you know, so many other people and those impacts radiate outward. So it's not just a line, but that line does also show, you know, this is what we're dealing with. Um, and this is a little more specific to what we're talking about today. Um, some information um, regarding 
hospital discharges of neonates that were impacted, babies that were impacted um, either with withdrawal symptoms or, or that were impacted by maternal use of drugs of addiction. So it's kind of a little bit of a messy statistic. Um, you could tease it out, but really it just shows um, the distribution around the state by county of um, the impact on uh, newborns. And you can see that it's not evenly geographically distributed. I was really interested to see the rates in New York City, for example, are really, really low. Um, and uh, I believe in the, the region where we are right now, there's you know obviously some higher rates. The graphs on the side there, um, the bottom line, the green line is New York State as a whole. The red line is um, Ulster and Delaware counties. Um, I'm curious, you know, so it looks like in one of those counties, I think it's Delaware County, it seems to be reducing, although it was at a quite high point at one there. And then in Ulster, it looks like it never quite hit that really high point, but seems to be rising. I mean, it's a statistic, take it as you will, but it's kind of interesting to have that visual. And what is that? So those are, that's the rate of per 1,000 discharges of newborns that were impacted by um, substance use disorder, whether exhibiting symptoms of neonatal opioid withdrawal symptom syndrome, or um, it just says impacted by maternal use. So I'm not entirely sure exactly what that statistic ref reflects, um, how they got that information and stuff, but it's an example of that. And is the darker color, the blue color, the worst? Yes, okay. that is correct. The highest rates, yeah. Um, so. It would be wrong to talk about maternal mortality, perinatal risk without acknowledging that there are simultaneous and overlapping intersecting crises that are happening. Um, so I want to take this, I wanna break this down a little bit here. So the United States as a whole experiences significantly higher rates of perinatal maternal mortality um, than other comparably wealthy countries. Um, everyone who gives birth in this country, you know, faces a higher possibility of something bad happening. However, those impacts are not evenly distributed and hopefully everyone in this room is aware of that. Um, there is a particular crisis affecting black women um, in the United States and in New York specifically. The bottom two lines are maternal mortality rates amongst white women, both in um, the bottom, the blue number is US, the purple is New York. Um, the orange and red lines are maternal mortality among black women. The red is the United States, the orange is New York. Our state is doing horribly. It is, it is a, just, a, it's, yeah, um, it's a crisis. And that, simply put, is caused by racism. <laughs> whether structural racism, whether implicit bias, whether interpersonal racism, you know, this is a symptom and a tragic effect of that. I'm naming it because A, it needs to be said all the time. Um, but B, I don't want, when we're talking about the impact of opioid overdose um, on maternal mortality, I don't want to lose the, the fact that, so opioid overdose affects people of all backgrounds, right? Like it is not a race specific thing. It can happen across to anybody. However, statistically speaking, it is more common among white women than black women. And so I don't want us to lose, I don't want us to say, okay, we're going to cure the maternal mortality crisis by avoiding overdose, right? Because that would, not, that would not impact the racial disparity that exists. So I know this is a little complex, but I just really wanna make it clear, it matters, it's important to everyone, and we also need to address the specific ways that racism impacts black women's uh, outcomes in, in birth and, and after. So however, here today, we are talking about, you know, the impact of opioid use disorder, um, <laughs> on you know childbearing families and um, overdose is accountable opioid overdose specifically is accountable for about 10 percent of pregnancy associated deaths in the united states so what that means there's a lot of different measures of um, harm that happens to people around pregnancy and birth pregnancy associated deaths refers to deaths in um, pregnancy or in the year postpartum regardless of whether they are caused by having been pregnant um, that acknowledges that the postpartum year is a particularly vulnerable and important time. Um, and just as we were talking about how any overdose, you know, the, 
the tragedy of that like ripples outwards, there is a particular impact, you know, when it's somebody, um, a, you know, a mother, someone who has given birth um, within the last year and the impacts that that has on the child, on their community, on their family. So it just kind of acknowledges. And the statistics show that the year postpartum is a particularly vulnerable time for overdose deaths. Um, so in this four year period that was studied, um, the rate of increase in overdose deaths among reproductive aged women overall was 38%. Among people in the postpartum year was 80%. So twice, twice as high, the rate of overdose during the postpartum year was twice as high as among comparable um, demographics that were not in the postpartum year. So that presents specific risk factors for loss of life. Um, and we'll talk about that. Um, so we've been talking about this a lot and I don't wanna belabor it, but I think a really important, um, it's, it's just so essential to reframe um, substance use, opioid use disorder as a chronic relapsing illness rather than a moral failing. Um, I find it really helpful um, as like a, a metaphor to use diabetes, which that was addressed earlier too. It's not a perfect analogy, but it can really help shift our understanding. So um, there are risk factors for experiencing this illness, um, a lot of which were talked about earlier with adverse childhood events. Those aren't, it's not only people that experience ACEs that, that develop substance use disorder, but it is a risk factor, just like there's risk factors for diabetes. Um, obviously, vast numbers of people in our communities in general, and then specifically with substance use disorder, have experienced different forms of interpersonal violence and trauma. Um, opioid use disorder, any use disorder, is characterized by periods of exacerbation and remission. Um, the way that we were talking earlier about the neurobiology of this, like a use disorder, opioid use disorder specifically, restructures parts of the brain and, that are involved in sort of reward pathways. It restructures the brain um, in ways that make it extremely difficult, extremely difficult to, to stop using. Um, and um, the underlying vulnerability to that never goes away completely. So somebody with a substance use disorder history, even if they are able to maintain abstinence for many years, over time, I do believe in like the brain's, you know, has some plasticity, it has some ability to like rebuild itself, but that, um, they, that person is always going to be at greater risk for, you know, a relapse. Um, and I like this phrase, perfect control of symptoms is difficult, right? It's, it is difficult. <laughs> I mean, there's so many things like that. Um, so one of the things that we keep talking about today is stigma. Um, one of my favorite, there's a lot of different definitions of stigma, but one that I really appreciate is from the National Harm Reduction Coalition, um, which is a really great organization. They developed um, this um, prenatal harm reduction toolkit, um, which I'll show a picture of later. Um, so stigma is a social process linked to power and control, which leads to creating stereotypes and assigning labels to those that are considered to deviate from the norm. This is the really important part. Stigma creates the social conditions that make people who use drugs believe they are not deserving of being treated with dignity and respect, and that makes people who care for these, these individuals believe that they are not worthy of dignity and respect, right? And so that is what we are here to, <laughs> to reframe and, and <clears throat> What happens, I think that stigma, part of how it works interpersonally, is it functions to create a separation between me and you. Because that lets me believe that I would never be you. You are something other than me. You are not the same as me. That is called dehumanization. That is seeing an individual as not being, you know, one <laughs> with us, like not being a member of our of our of our world of our community and so whenever we you know create self and other less than you know that's that's dehumanization and that leads to um you know i mean vast amounts of harm also wanting to just briefly um there's like often these things get talked about as the same so people who use drugs you know is a harm reductionist term that is intended to you know place the person first rather than their substance use um, opioid use disorder or substance use disorder is naming it as, you know, a, an illness um, that people experience. Um, there's also, you know, a really big difference in terms of what people's experiences are based on whether they are still in active use versus whether 
their use disorder is you know, being effectively treated to. So not wanting to lump all of that together, but as was discussed by our panelists earlier, that stigma exists regardless of where you are on that spectrum. Maybe you experience it in different ways, but um, even people who are in remission, in treatment, doing all the things still are you know, experiencing the harm of stigma. So people who have substance use disorder and are pregnant um, represent probably one of the top most stigmatized groups in our society. I think we can all agree um, to that. And that stigma can take many forms. Um, there's interpersonal, which people named so well up here too. Um, and you know, we'll briefly address the criminalization, um, which is you know, again, a source of such harm. And thankfully that is less of an issue in New York State, but still worth mentioning. But here I wanna really focus on the impact of stigma when it is, when you receive it from people who are supposed to be taking care of you. So healthcare providers, other service providers, um, you know, pharmacy staff. Since I've been working at REACH, I've been like blown away by how much trauma and stigma people experience just going to pick up their medicine at the pharmacy and what a barrier that can be to access these life-saving medications. Um, so the impact is that people don't get as much care. If somebody feels like they are, if somebody is being treated horribly and with suspicion and with judgment and unkindness, it is like, which of us would want to go into a situation where we'd be experiencing that? You know, none of us would. And so it's a barrier to entry to care. And that's especially important in pregnancy. I mean, it's important all the time. But in pregnancy, prenatal care has been shown to dramatically reduce the rates of different kinds of complications that impact both the birth giver and the baby. And um, that is that difference is, is extra big, <laughs> extra pronounced um, in people with substance use disorder. So if you look at one Bar like um, barometer of, of well-being is like low birth weight. So, you know, low birth weight can happen for a lot of different reasons, but if you look at it around populations, like it's reflective of, you know, a lot of things. So um, people with substance use disorder who like receive care, the rate of like low birth weight is so much lower than those that don't. And it's a more dramatic difference than in people that don't have substance use disorder. So it saves lives of, you know, mothers, birth givers, it saves lives of babies. And if there are any barriers that prevent people from being able to access that care and access treatment for their use disorder, you know, that is going to reduce, re result in death, De deaths of babies, deaths of mothers, you know. Um, so that's, the impact that I want to be focusing on today, but obviously all these other aspects as well are impacted for people. Briefly, um, criminalizing use disorders um, and specifically criminalizing use disorders in pregnancy. So there are a number of states where you can actually be put in jail um, for disclosing use um, during pregnancy specifically. Um, that really doesn't encourage people to receive prenatal care, right? Like it's just so harmful, it's so punitive, it's so harmful. American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, ACOG is the big professional organization. Um, you know, drug enforcement policies that deter pregnant people from seeking prenatal care are contrary to the welfare of the mother and fetus. Incarceration and the threat of incarceration have proved to be ineffective in reducing the incidence of alcohol or drug use or abuse, so like, Fear of prosecution leads to avoidance of prenatal care and treatment leads to worse outcomes. That should be clear. Um, harm reduction is my orientation towards this work and I think a lot of people here as well. Um, I'm constantly learning more about what harm reduction means and I find that it's one of those things that is just an incredible gift um, because the more I learn about harm reduction, like the better I don't know, like the better of a human being I become. And it applies to like all aspects of life, not just, um, not just working with folks with substance use disorder. So essentially it's um, attempting to reduce harm. <laughs> it is acknowledging and centering the dignity and humanity of um, people who use drugs. Um, it is, uh, you know, can include a lot of different things like medications for opioid use disorder, needle exchanges, supervised injection sites. One thing I heard a lot from my panelists is like, if I hadn't had access to X, Y, or Z, I would be dead right now. Harm reduction saves lives. Um, you know, it is meeting someone where they are at and without judgment and, you know, helping people to stay alive and stay safe as they navigate their own journey, as they are empowered to navigate their own journey 
towards recovery or towards safer use or towards you know, whatever that endpoint is for them. Um, and, and it's not about ignoring, sorry, just briefly, it's not about ignoring or minimizing the fact that substance use like, can have very real harms associated with it. In fact, you know, which is often what it's accused of, but really it's harm reduction. It's acknowledging those harms and trying to you know, prevent as much as possible. Reducing stigma, we've been talking about that a lot today. Um, we talked about language, so person first, language, a person with, some, with a use disorder rather than an addict. Now, there's, again, I think that the, energy, or the feelings behind the words matter just as much as the words do. Um, that said, I do think it's really important that we um, model the use of language that reduces stigma. Um, so, for example, um, I don't like to use the words like clean or dirty, you know, like clean urine. It's a urine that does not contain these, you know, substances that we're looking for or whatever. Like there's, there's a lot of ways that language can convey stigma. Um, so trauma-informed care, we've talked about a lot. I'm not going to belabor, but knowing that we all, you know, I love the universal precautions, right? It's just like we all put on gloves when we're interacting with blood because, you never know what blood might contain a bloodborne pathogen. We all are trying to use trauma-informed care when working with any human being because anyone may have experienced trauma. Um, and that, especially for people, so, you know, for somebody who, is, who has had a, um, you know, kind of advanced um, use disorder, like, 110% they're going to have experienced trauma. Whether or not they had prior to, um, you know, experiencing their substance use disorder, they absolutely will through the duration of that. Um, and so it's especially important to um, emphasize the importance of consent, you know, before touching a person, before asking a person things, before asking about their use disorder. Is it okay if I ask you some questions about this? That helps build that relationship of respect. Um, Honestly, like, so at REACH, you know, it blows my mind every single day that I work there, I have people that I'm caring for um, tell me that it has, like, changed their lives to simply be treated as a human being in a medical setting. And I'm just like, on the one hand, that's so great and I love that, and on the other hand, it's so upsetting. Like, why should that be the bar? Like, like why should that be such a revolutionary experience for people. So honestly, and somebody said it earlier too, just being kind, just, just starting with kindness, you know, that, is a, that goes a long way. Um, and then the last point I wanna make here um, is just recognizing the value of staff being representative of communities served, and that um, goes across various ident marginalized identities, um, including um, having a substance use history. Um, that, you know, imagine the gifts that our panelists that were here before bring to the work that they are doing, like just, uh, you know, unbelievably rich and, and beneficial for those being served. So, and I just want to briefly name, like, you know, I think that we need a national, like, cultural change in the conversation around substance use disorder. Um, we need to look at, like, you know, what are the underlying root causes of illness, you know, in our communities? Like, are our communities healthy? Are they strong? Are they vibrant? Um, I, it feels like there is an epidemic of abuse and trauma and despair. And so how can we strengthen our communities? How can we strengthen our networks of care for each other? Um, you know, all of those things that might not seem directly related are gonna create like a web, a strong web to hold all of us in and, you know, help support people in all the ways. Um, and also, you know, we need to decriminalize the symptoms of deeper illness, in my opinion. So delving into um, uh, pregnant people with substance use disorder, some of the data I have is around substance use disorder in general. A lot of it is around opioid use disorder. I'm trying to distinguish between them um, when, you know, for data. So um, obviously, like we said, there's a difference between somebody who has a treated use disorder versus untreated. Um, a lot of the studies don't necessarily distinguish that, so it can be a little harder to tease out some of the um, impacts. But you know, especially folks that have um, in the past or currently, you know, um, experienced injection drug use, um, there are higher rates of things like hep C, HIV, um, you know, in people that are in active use, there's often nutritional deficiencies that also can complicate pregnancy, um, high rates of tobacco use as well. Um, so these are all, you know, 
comorbidities or other, um, other challenges that are often associated with um, substance use disorder. And then of course, exposure to violence, like we've been talking about both historically and at that time. There is a lot of really sensationalist information out there about the impact of, um, of substances on pregnancy. Um, you know, there's babies born addicted, crack babies, you know, like all this really stigmatizing and sensationalizing ways of talking about this. And I don't want to say that there is not harm associated with use. However, I think we need to really be realistic about what those harms are. And often they are being exaggerated and, you know, just sensationalized. So on average, babies that are exposed to um, opioids and to um, the medications that you use to treat opioid use disorder um, have a higher rate of what's called neonatal abstinence syndrome, which we're going to talk about, which is basically a, a withdrawal um, that babies experience after birth. All of these other um, things that are named here higher rates of preterm labor, preterm birth, growth restriction, stillbirth, um, placental abruption, maybe. Um, all of those can be at least reduced, if not eliminated, with prenatal care and um, access to medication treatment of opioid use disorder. Um, so, you know, there's no um, associated syndrome that we've been able to identify. So, for example, fetal alcohol syndrome, as many people know, um, is, a, is a lifelong syndrome that is um, something that babies that are exposed to high levels of alcohol in utero can experience, and that can have lifelong cognitive impacts, other developmental um, impacts. There's no similar syndrome um, for people, for babies that are exposed to opioids. Um, there's no there's likely no association with birth defects. Um, there's some studies that showed a small increase, others that don't. Most of what's come out is that it's just, there is no increased risk of, of you know, birth defects. Um, I don't love the term birth defects, but we'll move on. Um, the other thing I'm gonna say is that a lot of there, there are, for example, I was just reading a study yesterday that showed that, you know, Babies that are impacted by opioid use disorder have higher, have a significantly higher risk of death within the year postpartum. Um, looking at that, it is very difficult to tease out, um, and in fact, I think probably has a lot less to do with exposure to the substance than the various other things that surround it. A lot of it has to do with um, like SIDS, for example, like safe sleep, um, exposure to tobacco, um, various other factors, um, not having had prenatal care. So from what I have been able to see in the research so far, it does not appear to be related to the substance itself, but to the conditions that exist around that, which those are things we can do something about. So as the you know, speaker on the panelists before was talking about, Neonatal abstinence syndrome is a, um, basically, a, as ACOG calls it, a expected and treatable condition. Um, we don't know exactly the percentage. I've heard around 50%, 30 to 80% is what they say, to infants born to prenatal people taking opioid agonist therapy, which is the medications that are used to treat opioid use disorder. So um, it's characterized by disturbances in various systems. Um, it, essentially is the baby version of withdrawal that people experience when um, you know, they are physiologically dependent on a substance that is then taken away. So they're exposed in utero um, and then you know, experience these impacts. Um, it's temporary. Um, it should, no baby should have to be on medications for six months, um, as was talked about previously. It's typically anywhere between a few days, maybe a week, um, is usually the course of it. Um, you know, it's a little longer for people that are taking methadone than for people that are taking buprenorphine. Um, those are two different medications that are used to treat opioid use disorder. Um, and um, typically, it, like I said, it does re result in a longer hospital stay, but usually that's about five days. Um, and um, so I want to be really clear that neonatal abstinence syndrome is not the same as babies being born addicted. Um, so an addiction is a chronic illness that is characterized by behaviors and compulsive use. A baby does not, cannot, a baby cannot have an addiction. What a baby can have is a physiologic dependence that, you know, leads to those withdrawal symptoms that then resolves, you know, within that, that first week after the birth and, you know, can be really significant. I mean, if, if a baby has severe 
um, opioid NOWS or NAS, um, you know, that can lead to seizures. In rare cases, it could lead to death if it is not treated, which is why those babies stay in the hospital for up to five days to ensure that they have made that transition. Um, but it is not the same as addiction. That is the take home message. And, you know, that's something really important to communicate to. Um, pregnant people who are using these medications to um, these life-saving medications, um, there's a lot of fear on, oh my, will my baby be born addicted? No. Will your baby have a physiologic transition off of this medication? Yes. Um, you know, that can also be seen um, people that are taking antidepressants, um, people that use nicotine or tobacco, um, people that are on benzodiazepines. Like there's a lot of different substances that can cause that. Again, that is not the same as babies being born addicted. Interesting point. Really important, the dosage of the medication that the person is on does not correlate to the severity of the withdrawal. So you would think, oh, the higher the dose that I'm on, the worse my baby's gonna withdraw. Not true. Other contributing factors, like other substances that they're exposed to, genetic predisposition, the way the care is structured, um, whether a baby is um, supported to breastfeed or, or to um, chest feed in the case, um, all of those have more to do with the severity of symptoms. So what that means in practice, people will think, okay, well, I'm pregnant, so I should wean down off this medication that I'm on. I should, I should take less and less and less and less to reduce the likelihood that my baby will, will have withdrawal. It doesn't work that way. So the right dose of the medication to be on is the medication that keeps you stable throughout your pregnancy. And, some, and often, that actually will go up because of the changes in bodies during pregnancy. Metabolism happens faster. So often, instead of reducing your dosage, people need to have an increased dose of the medication. And that does not necessarily mean that the baby you know, will have more severe symptoms. Super important. So briefly, like, we're going to talk about some of these evidence-based practices that we've been alluding to as well. Um, Ideally, we're hitting people before they get pregnant, right? Like, so that's where, um, you know, screening for substance use disorder that is done in a consensual, trauma-informed, kind, non-judgmental way to identify people that are, are struggling with this, um, to ideally help people to access treatment and, you know, other resources. Um, you know, high levels of unplanned pregnancy among everybody, um, but also in specifically in this population. So if people want um, to not get pregnant, then obviously access to effective contraception is important. Let's also not assume that someone does not want to get pregnant just because they have a use disorder, like that's a stigmatizing belief right there. So just wanna briefly talk about this statistic because it kind of blew my mind and I work in this field. So there is a, statistical measure in healthcare that is called the number needed to treat, the NNT. And that is basically any intervention that we do, any medication, whatever, it's like how many people would you have to give this thing to to prevent one bad outcome? So for example, high blood pressure medication, life-saving, so many people are on them, probably a lot of people in this room are on them. You would have to basically give 125 people blood pressure medications to prevent one death from stroke or heart attack. So that's the number needed to treat for blood pressure medications is 125. The number needed to treat to prevent one death with buprenorphine is less than three. Yeah, like it makes me tear up because imagine how many lives could have been saved, could still be saved. Like, and if, you, if, if, if anything happens that is an increase in barrier to people accessing these medications, if three people don't get this medication that need it, one of them will die. Like, th there is almost nothing in healthcare that is as effective as that. Like, it blows my mind, and I work in this field. Um, another thing I just want to briefly touch on, one of the panelists before was naming that, you know, when she was first getting started on the medication, she was kind of, like, not taking it seriously and was maybe going to, like, sell it or, you know, whatever. The interesting thing is, like, that is actually really normal. Um, and as the longer people are on this medication, the more those kinds of ways of using it decrease and the more um, the use of other substances decreases and the more stability increases. So if you mandate, oh, somebody has to be, you know, has to be abstinent from all substances to receive this prescription for this medication, like then when they're still in that early stage, like then they're going to be cut off and they might die, you know? The longer people are on it, the more of a stabilizing effect it has. And, you know, the, 
the more people are able to heal and gradually move on. So it's not an all or nothing. And if you're taking buprenorphine, um, that is Suboxone or Subutex, that's the active ingredient in those medications. Um, even if you were to shoot up a bunch of heroin, you would be so much less likely to die from overdose. It has that protective factor. So I want everybody to be taking this medication that has opioid use disorder, whether or not they're still injecting, whether or not they're using meth, whatever, like this is going to help keep people alive, like so much. So best practices in pregnancy, again, universal screening for substance use disorder. How many people don't even get asked or get asked in a way that feels stigmatizing or, you know, like this is where having trust-based relationships, um, you know, is really important. And it's like, you know, how we, there's ways to have these conversations where we're honest, um, you know, where we say, you know, this is, this is something I'd like to ask you about. Is that okay? There's various different screening tools that can be utilized. There's not one that has emerged as like the best. Um, but um, consent, and, and what I will say is ACOG, all of these organizations are actually not in support of universal urine drug testing. The screening tools are verbal, they are communication. A urine drug test is so flawed, there's false positives, there's false negatives, it represents one moment in time. Somebody having heroin in their urine does not actually mean that they have a use disorder. Maybe that was the only time they ever used it. Maybe it was, you know, I, who knows? So it's just not an effective, and it tends to create this us versus them mentality and lack of trust. This medications for opioid use disorder, whether methadone or buprenorphine in the form of Suboxone or Subutex or, um, you know, less so the, the injectable, but that as well, um, is the standard, the gold standard of care in pregnancy for people with opioid use disorder. 70% um, reduction in overdose-related deaths, um, significant decrease in acquisition of HIV, Hep B, Hep C, increased retention in prenatal care um, and treatment, you know, recovery treatment, um, opportunity to access other supports and services. Um, I don't know why I really separate the pregnant person and the fetus because they're they're kind of connected, um, but, <laughs> but um, benefits to the fetus specifically is that they're not exposed. So when somebody's getting high and then in withdrawal, that is a lot more destabilizing for the baby because they're experiencing these peaks and dips. It's a stressor to the baby. When people, when the baby is just exposed to a steady state of the buprenorphine, they're able, I'm, I'm a little biased towards that just because that's the medication that I work with, but methadone as well. Um, methadone has some advantages um, and disadvantages compared to buprenorphine, which we can talk about if we have time, but um, decreased risk of death for the baby, um, decreased risk of growth restriction, decreased risk of preterm birth, decreased risk of exposure to viral pathogens. Um, all the organizations that have anything to do with the care of pregnant people support this. Like it is 100% like the best thing that you can do if you have an opioid use disorder and you are pregnant. Um, and on the other side, so, and I get it, with all the stigma that exists, so many pregnant people are like, how can I get off this medicine? You know, like, I want to detox. I hate that word, but it's a word. Um, medically supervised withdrawal. So of pregnant people that um, are, you know, attempt to, to either to get off those medications, to, you know, detox from them, um, only 16% um, were able to maintain abstinence until the time of birth. So that is not a good number. That means that 84% of people return to active use during pregnancy. And that's where you know, the risks come in, is a return to active use. And if you have been on these medications, you've lost your tolerance. When you go off of them, it's like people that are coming out of incarceration or things like that. You're going to have a higher risk of death from overdose as well. I mean, it's just, it's, if someone absolutely is adamant that that's what they're going to do, you support them in that and you monitor them and you let them know that if they return to active use, you still love them and care about them and want them to come back and re-enter treatment. So like, that's one thing that happens is people are like, oh, I don't want to tell them that I, that I relapsed and then it just spirals, you know? So like really just like, okay, if you want to go this path, that is fine. I am concerned about you, but that is okay. And we're going to like, just stay in really close touch here, you know? Um, I have a lot of information about um, MOUD in pregnancy, and I would love to share that with anyone that wants some of the more specific like data about how to do that. But a couple things I do want to point out. Um, so 
there's a couple different formulations of buprenorphine. There, so there's like primarily it's like Suboxone, which also contains naloxone in it, and Subutex, and but which is just the buprenorphine. Either is okay in pregnancy. They used to just put everybody on. Um, subutex in pregnancy because there was a concern about the naloxone. It's not absorbed when taken um, sublingually, so it's not an issue. But still, you know, mostly people are transitioned to subutex. Either way is okay. Either way is safe. It is 100% safe to give Narcan if someone who is pregnant is overdosing. So sometimes people worry, what will the impact be on the baby? Because precipitated withdrawal in a baby is like not a great thing. It's better than death. <laughs> So you can give Narcan to pregnant people, please do, um, if anybody is overdosing. Um, we talked about how you might need to actually increase the dose in pregnancy. Both are good, methadone and buprenorphine. There's pros and cons to each. I'm not going to belabor it, but I'm happy to chat with anybody about it that wants to know more later. I just know we are time sensitive. Long-term outcomes, this is important to briefly address. So we're still learning, right? Like, like we don't have, you know, 30, 40 year long studies on this stuff. However, of the data that has emerged so far, um, physical, behavioral, developmental outcomes are similar. This is for methadone versus buprenorphine. Developmental outcomes are similar for babies who did have um, NAS versus those who did not. So basically what it's showing is that the kids that are um, exposed to these medications in pregnancy are doing fine, <laughs> short version. Really important to talk about this. Um, labor and birth, um, for those of the, you that have not experienced it, is pretty intense. Um, <laughs> can bring up stuff. It can be a time, it's, it's a challenging time. You know, it's a, it can be a beautiful, exciting, lovely, wonderful time, but it's like, it's an intense time. There tends to be a lot of pain, um, I'm not gonna lie. Um, and so it's really, 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 really important that people not be taken off of these life-saving medications when they are entering the hospital um, in labor um, or to be induced or for their C-section or whatever. Um, it should be continued at their out-of-hospital dose or potentially increased in the hospital. Um, 100%. If somebody has been taking methadone outside, you don't want to give them buprenorphine because that could precipitate withdrawal. Um, that's bad. We don't want that. So whatever they have been prescribed, and even though methadone outside of the hospital has to be given in specifically certified you know, centers, in the hospital it can be given without special certification. So if somebody comes in and they're on methadone, they can be continued on methadone while they are in the hospital. So, so, so important. Um, People who have long-term exposure to opioids, whether prescribed or through an opioid use disorder, whatever, um, have reduced, they get less pain relief from pain relieving medications. Um, and they have what's called hyperalgesia, increased sensitivity to pain. So it is actually a lot harder to treat pain. And the two things that people are most afraid of that I hear when they're going into this situation are, will my pain be ignored, unfortunately, a lot of the time it will, and that is wrong. Um, you know, people, it's like, oh, well, she's on, you know, Suboxone, so we're not going to treat her pain because that will trigger relapse or something like so wrong. So yes, you can still treat with opioids. Um, you know, that should be an individual conversation with the patient. Most people that have a vaginal birth don't need um, opioids for pain relief postpartum, but people that have cesarean birth, um, you know, may need that. And it may need to be given at higher doses than for people who are not taking these medications because they block a lot of the receptors. That's how they work. They don't block all of the receptors though, so opioids can still be effective for pain relief. Um, but, you know, also important, not just for people with opioid use disorder, but everybody, to maximize non-opioid um, pain relief. So giving ibuprofen around the clock, giving Tylenol around the clock, there's plenty of other options that are available, but they should not be denied opioids for post, you know, surgical pain simply because they're on buprenorphine or have a use disorder. Um, epidurals are totally compatible with um, these medications. You shouldn't give like Nubane or some of these other um, agonist antagonists because that can cause precipitated withdrawal. Again, we don't want that. It's like you go from feeling fine and normal to feeling like the worst flu of your life in like five seconds. It's not a good thing. Um, but otherwise, all other forms of general anesthesia is fine. Nitrous oxide is fine um, in combination with those medications. Um, and just want to name labor support. Like labor is hard for anybody, but if somebody has additional risk factors of you know stigma, you know of um, you know who knows what kind of you know support system they have outside. You know, compassionate support during labor is really essential. And I was so excited to hear that a couple of these folks were doulas. Um, I think they were postpartum doulas, which is also super important. But having you know. 
ways to ensure that people are supported in their labor and birth is important for everybody, but especially folks that are you know, in these kinds of situations. Postpartum, we talked about that pain relief. And I just want to name, you know, a lot of these things are looking sort of at people that are currently stable on medications. Let's also be honest about the fact that people do enter care to give birth when they are still in active use. And that is just the, such a vulnerable and challenging and destabilizing time. And it's like, that is where people need like the most compassion, like the most love, like the most support, the most understanding, you know, it's just a really, 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 really hard time. Um, and, and to, that's where, you know, non-stigmatizing care is like the most essential. And it can also, for some people that may be an opportunity to, you know, give treatment a try if they're treated, you know, in, with respect and with care. And for other people, they may not be ready for that and whatever, but just, you know, holding them with love and care and gentleness and, tolerance and all of these things, you know, regardless of how challenging that situation may be. However challenging it is for like me as a midwife or like someone as a nurse, it is like a million times more challenging for that individual that's actually going through it, right? Um, I do want to talk about, really, this is pretty easy. So <laughs> the best practices for neonatal abstinence syndrome management were really not what was described up here. And that was like where I just had such a reaction to hearing that it's heartbreaking. So, you know, to in the past, they'd take the baby away to the NICU, they would start dosing them on um, morphine. And, you know, sometimes that is necessary to have that medication to treat, like that, that can be life-saving. But first steps are comfort, are breastfeeding or chest feeding if that person is open to doing that. Not everybody, if you have a significant trauma history, sometimes people are not comfortable with that and that's fine. It is protective, it does help the, the baby to transition through that, but even if you are not you know, feeding the baby from your body, doing skin to skin, doing, you know, and other caregivers can do skin to skin too. Other caregivers can, you know, swaddle and, and like really hold that baby. Though like rates, and, and I loved what the panelist described because she was saying how by her last baby, that baby didn't even need any medicine. She was probably on the same dosage of her medication that she was before, but because that hospital and she, they all embraced you know, this, this way of caring for the baby that just kind of is like helping them through that, that baby didn't even need the medicine. you know. And so there's one method called eat, sleep, console. Rooming in um, is the standard of care. So if people are capable, if it's, you know, people are willing to have the baby stay in the room with them and to have a lot of staff support around um, the birth giver in terms of like how to swaddle the baby, how to console the baby. If they, if she or they are getting like frazzled and overwhelmed, then the nurses can, you know, step in, take a turn, whatever. Um, but supporting that dyad, you know, that parent baby dyad, um, reduced hospital stays, reduced use of medications, it works really well and is so much gentler. Like, I don't know, like you don't want to have your baby ripped away from you. Like every instinct in your body is saying close, you know, and that's actually what's needed. So isn't that cool? And then, um, <clears throat> so postpartum, um, as we talked about in the beginning, is a period of extreme vulnerability for everybody, right? Like, I mean, who hasn't heard of postpartum depression, um, postpartum anxiety, postpartum psychosis? Like these are things that could happen to even the most resourced people because it is really hard and our society is not structured in a way that actually supports people effectively in that postpartum time period. But especially if you have a trauma history, especially if you have, you know, if you're experiencing stigmatizing care, especially if you, you know, have opioid use disorder history, you know, that increases so much and people, birth givers with opioid use disorder are six times more likely to die in the year after giving birth. So that can be prevented. One thing that I just think is like both really infuriating but also hopeful is that the majority of postpartum people who experience fatal overdose had had an ER visit in between the birth and their death. So that was an opportunity to save their life you know, that was missed. And that's where the like, I'm getting like goosebumps from, but it's also an opportunity that we have, you know, people are trying to get help in whatever way they can, you know, sometimes those ways aren't seen um, or understood that whole horrible, like frequent flyer thing or whatever. But that is an opportunity to save that person's life. Okay. And um, also just want to name that trauma history can complicate bonding with the baby. So sometimes people do need, and like the, 
people up here were saying, you know, if you don't have, if you haven't experienced like a healthy parent-child relationship before, it takes support to um, develop that, and and it might take time. Like sometimes people are like, I don't feel anything for this for this this creature that like came out of me, and I'm super freaked out because you know I'm not having that like glowing. And it's like, well, of course not. You're not primed to. You know, you may or may not experience that immediately, but it will build over time with gentleness and support and af affirmation and care. Um, and also, um, lactation support is so important here too, which is why it's so great that they have both the postpartum doula and lactation support. That's totally what is needed. And you know that lactation um, can be really um, protective for the baby. It can be protective um, for the birth giver as well. Also not mandatory. I think we have to be really careful around like, you must do this because it's the best thing because it's not the best thing for everybody. Some people's trauma histories or life circumstances do not make that a good idea or do not, they just can't and that's fine. Um, there's other ways to support bonding. Um, and yeah. Um, Oh, safe sleep, that's what's hidden down there. I do wanna name that, um, so uh, I think that there's a case to be made um, increasingly, people are talking about, well, you know, sometimes co-sleeping can be done in a way that is safe, et cetera. Um, if you're taking medications for opioid use disorder, that does count as one of those medications that you know, can increase the risks of co-sleeping. So especially important to educate people about, you know, have the baby right by your bed, have the baby in your room where you can like access the baby, but not in the same bed with you. And that's gonna actually, and also um, minimizing exposure of the baby to tobacco smoke, um, even on clothing, those are things that are gonna increase the safety in terms of reducing those numbers as far as like SIDS and things like that. All right, I think we're almost done. So just naming that, you know, all of us have a part to play in improving, you know, outcomes for, for these people, for these, you know, members of our communities and families. And um, so acknowledging that, and then I think we were just gonna, you know, if folks had questions or um, you can go to the next slide, I think it's just saying, yeah, how can we improve care? Um, and also if you have know, questions for me or comments. My understanding is that in many places where women go to deliver, the, they depending upon how you present, if you're poor, if you're a person of color, that they will test your urine without you knowing. What does the law say? And what are your rights under that? That's a good question. I'm not a lawyer, so I, don't, I wanna be a little careful here. Um, I believe that people are required to um, consent for that. Unfortunately, it's often considered to be in that blanket consent to be treated that you sign when you first enter um, the hospital. So it's not, the, what, ethically what it should be is that somebody is told or at least ask consent. Everybody is has the right to deny, but they to de to deny that testing. But they should also be informed about what the impacts of that would be. And I think that, you know, we have a long way to go. Um, you know, somebody <laughs> using these medications that are the gold standard of care to treat their illness should not, in and of itself, be an indicator for a CPS referral. Should like absolutely not. And you know, I really question the role of urine drug testing. At all, I mean, so at the hospital where I work, like they test everybody to try to avoid the bias thing, but I don't think that's good either, you know? I mean, it's better than being like, you look like you use drugs here, I'm gonna test you, but it's still, it's still not great. So I, I think, but yeah, as to the legal landscape, I, I don't have as much knowledge about that. But really good point. Um, I just want to thank you for the presentation. I just, it was such amazing information. I'm in this field a long time and I mean, there were, there were things that I didn't know. Um, and I, my question is, um, this is such important information. And I'm just wondering, how, how do we get that out to the general public in, in, in terms of destigmatizing? Because not, not everyone's going to be able to sit through an hour presentation who's not in the field and doesn't know what MOUD is. Mm -hmm. How do we get that out to the general public to, to have them understand? So this you know, idea of crack babies and yeah. you know, this, this, I don't know. Yeah, no, that's such a such an important point. I think it's like I don't think there's one answer to that. I think that we have to take like a multifaceted approach towards transforming that, and it can be even in our one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. But um, I mean, I know that you all are doing a lot of work around that in terms of like you know media strategies and things like that. How we're going to communicate this, and and it's I mean, you know, it these kinds of things spread gradually, like like you know tide changes in terms of how we understand things as a culture, you know, happen gradually, but it's all the different little things. And I guess I also would just emphasize that's where even just like having a conversation with your colleague or with your family member or whatever, all those little pieces do contribute to this greater, you know. 
I just wonder if you know anything about this new Zaloxone, maybe not new, but um, it is scary. To the me. xylazine? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I know, um, I mean, I'm encountering it. Um, it, is, it is definitely scary. Um, you know, I don't, we don't, it's such a new thing that we don't have a lot of specific data around whether there's different impacts to pregnancy with xylazine um, than with other medications. But, you know, one thing I will say about that is it's sort of like, to me, it's also a testimony to why criminalization is not the solution to this public health problem. Because whenever a substance is criminalized, that doesn't lead to stopping use. It leads to new substances emerging that we don't have as good treatments for, or we don't have as good data around or, as in, or information around. So that's a big picture policy question. Um, you know, we're certainly, you know, the way that I'm seeing with the xylazine is like, how can we, um, it's really difficult to address some of the wound care um, aspects of, of that um, substance. Um, but yeah, I don't know specifically how it impacts pregnancy yet, because it's so new. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.